Nicholas Farrelly and this is the fourth episode of the Thailand in Crisis vodcast and podcast series brought to you from the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific in Canberra. Today we're going to be talking about history and political protests in Thailand. Who better to bring in on this kind of conversation than Professor Tongchai Winichikun from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He's going to be joining us over a Skype connection. Here in Canberra, I'll also be joined by my regular Dr. Andrew Walker, who'll be talking about agriculture and national budgets in the Thai case. I know he's got a few interesting things to share. As ever, if you'd like to leave comments for us, you can do so at the ANU's YouTube channel, or you can join in the conversation at New Mandala. Our first guest today really needs no introduction. He is Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Tongchai Winichikun. Professor Tongchai Winichikun, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for having me on your program. Tongchai, many of our viewers and listeners will already be aware that you're one of Thailand's most prominent historians. So of course it makes sense to begin today's interview with a little bit of history. Some of our viewers and listeners won't, however, be aware that in the 1970s, you were, well before you were a historian, a prominent Thai student leader. In the protests of 1976, you were active, uh, and then, of course, you were locked up in government detention for two years after those protests. Can you perhaps tell us a little bit more about your experiences during that time? What are your memories of those difficult years? And more specifically, can you tell us a bit about what it was like to be locked up in government detention? I imagine that it was a very emotional and, and even a very difficult time. Uh, if, if we talk about those two years in jail, uh, it, it was harsh, it was difficult in the early months. But overall, it's not as difficult or as bad as people might imagine. Uh, there were times in the first few weeks that uh, it was very scary. Like there's one night, the police took each of us, the, the so-called ringleaders of the, of the student uh, movement. They took us in a kind of a two or three emergency police, police convoy and uh, take each of us into separate places. <laughs> it was scary, so I, I thought that that was it, uh, the final. But uh, no, uh, once we get to the morning, they just brought us back together in the same cell again. So even up to now, I don't know what happened that night. Uh, otherwise, the hardship was uh, not as bad. Of course, I mean, locked up for two years is bad enough, but uh, in terms of such as physical things, a few punches, a few time, uh, but mostly uh, it's about un unhealthy, filthy, crowded cells. There was one time that very small cell, like a three or four, three by four meters, and including the, the, the toilet inside, eight of us uh, in the same room. So at night it's like a, it's like a, it's like it's like fish in a can. We just have to. Be careful uh, when we sleep, not to, I mean, hurt other people. But, uh, or living without a son for a year and bad food. Uh, but looking back, I was only 19 years old at the time. So, although the tragedy was, was, was bad enough, I mean, very heavy in my mind, but uh, the radical spirit, the feeling like uh, willing to fight on, the anger for revenge, and uh, I think include very, very important is, is the hope for a successful revenge, the hope that a revolution will come. All of this led to a kind of fantasy, that uh, a fantasy that, okay, one day revolution will take place, Congress will open the prison door and let us out. And to have such a fantasy in jail and at that young age, uh, it turns out it, it, it was not a bad thing. 
So it's like a psychological drug to, to postpone the reality. The sense of, uh, what is it, guilt or heavy burden, uh, terrible sadness, uh, hopelessness, that kind of thing. Hopelessness, I mean, and, and, and by later years I realized that I'm, I'm part of it. I can't just say that, blame everybody else. Uh, we are part of it. But let's say the true understanding of the suffering many people went through, families of people who lost, and even including my own parents. I mean, those kind of true understanding didn't sink in until, until the fantasy was gone. So after, after many more friends die in jungles for, for nothing. So I think it, it was those years that, that the loss on the October 6th, the killing that I saw, the fear, scream, cries, anger that's still in my memory. I mean, the suffering that my parents went through. It's later years that, that those things began to sink. Even though those later years I was already out from jail. So I don't know. I'm not sure being a political prisoner in jail at that young age with the fantasy or the later years when I grew up, when I'm a bit older and when our fantasy is gone. I'm not sure which one is more difficult. As a historian, you have often written and talked about issues of memory. Uh, these are issues, of course, that are of interest to any historian, uh, but in the Thai case there are particular stories to be told about the collective memory of the events of October 1976. Do you, beyond any reflections that you might have about those matters, uh, see any parallels between that period and what we have all just witnessed in 2010? We usually assume that the first-hand individual memories are, are like uh, different pieces of jigsaw and then when we put it there, it would form a total picture or the total picture of what happened. Uh, no, no, that's not how a collective memory is established. Uh, a collective memory is never the total sum of, the, of individual memories. And uh, in case of, of, of massacre uh, memories, I found the interesting thing is that uh, the master narrative emerged pretty quickly a few hours after the killing. A few hours after the killing. The master narrative that is, 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 a, is, a, is a memory that individual memories can take part, I mean, can, can claim to attach, can claim to be part of the, of the big, for example, uh, the triumphant or the heroic memory of the, of the right wing uh, at the time, established quickly a few hours after the killing. Then many right wing people have their stories, oh, I, I was there, I saw this, I did that to be part of the larger right-wing collective memory. Whether or not those people saw that, did that, not sure. Like I read the two or three hundred uh, testimonies of these people giving to the police during the three months after the massacre. It's so clear that many of them did not witness what they said that they witnessed. It's, I mean, there are some details that is possible. Some people make it explicit that they know that, or they can tell the story, this and that happened, even though they were not there. Which means where they get the story, they get from the collective memory somewhere else, on TV, in newspapers, or from friends. And then they can put their own experience, put their own individual memories to be part of that. So, uh, a collective memory is not a total, the total sum of the individual ones. It's the opposite. I think it's established early and then individual memories can claim to be part of it or can share some elements of the, of the big, of the collective memory. So the curious thing is how, when, how and when the master narrative for each collective memory was, was established. I think that, that is tricky. It has nothing, well I shouldn't say nothing, but it has little to do with truth. It has little to do with fact in the sense that collective
collective memory must be true, collective memory must be factual based. No, not true. Collective memory is all ideological, bias, partisan, and always political. Uh, facts that fit it survive. Facts that don't fit it would be forgotten or at least were suppressed. Turning more fully now to those events of April and May 2010, can you give us some sense about what your initial reaction was, perhaps in terms of what your initial master narrative of these recent events has been? My initial reaction, sad. I, I don't know how to explain, just sad, very sad. Frustration that uh, I can watch it on, on the internet. Mm, can't do anything, killing again. Uh, it, it may sound a, a bit a bit of bragging, but I, I, I believe that I could sense the feeling of people at Raja Basom. I could be wrong, but I, I remember that initially. It, 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 it's not the same as, as being there. I, I didn't have the same anger and fear as I was in, in 76. I think because my physically I, I I was not there, but it's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling that sad, can't do anything, and just think. And it happened in, I mean, it, it's about midday in Bangkok. It's, it's about one o'clock something here. So it's quiet. Suddenly everything turned quiet. Yeah. How. The collective memory of, 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 of again, as I say, I think the collective memory for the, the, the May 2010 crackdown is, is, I believe that it's already emerged, but let's say for us, for me to, to see, to realize that it becomes collective memory, it's not that it hasn't emerged yet, I think it has already, but it may take us, take me a while to realize the, which one or the authority or the, the, the power of, of which story or which account. It might take a while for me to realize. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure that the contestation is still very strong. Hmm. That, that's how I can say how I feel, yeah. Who or what do you think is to blame for the recent crisis that we've seen playing out on the streets of Bangkok? If we have to put a blame I think uh, so many mistakes by so many people, but yet they are not as serious as the government. The blame should go to the government, very simple. I, I, I have an example when, I mean, for the mistakes or, yeah, for the mistakes or, or let's say something wrong that I think we have to put in, in, in perspective. Uh, again, Part of the problem, the blame is that it depends on the story that each people have. It depends on the story and it depends on perspective. It depends on when we started to, to when, when we start the story, when we end the story, what's the meaning of the story and then the blame should go for whom and to what extent. Uh, for example, the government blame the, the red, the UDD leaders. Many of them, based on their speeches, based on what they said at the demonstration, the government and some other people quoted the, the leaders. They said this, they said that, they, I mean, the head speech. Or let's, let's say, remember when they blamed that, oh, Thaksin said this, it means that Thaksin prepare the terrorist movement. Oh, uh, the leader, I'm not sure, Dr. Wood or Dr. Dupont said that about the burning, about the, uh, uh, if, 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 if the soldiers come, we can be frightened and then go into the store. That means the, those are the planned arsons. I think, I think those are exaggerated interpretations. If we take those words literally, well, in 76, we talk about blood in exchange for blood. We talk about taking arms. We talk about this and that. At the end, we, we didn't have arms. We didn't have weapons. So, so we have to be careful about, about putting blames, uh, not 
what exactly we added it and then put it in perspective. The part bottom line, in my, in my opinion, we should stand firm. We should stand firm on the, uh, I would say, this is how I see it, uh, the belief or the, on, on, the, on the, the view that uh, the red who want equal democratic rights, who want to end the injustice of double standards, those are not crimes. Those are not crimes. The protesters, the red people may cross the lines and made several mistakes, but fundamentally they were not committing, they did not commit crimes. They, they challenged the establishment. The bottom line is that Thailand and people who, uh, the, in Thailand, the pe people who, who challenge the establishment are, are usually considered worse than a criminal. That, that is wrong. So their mistakes should be put in perspective. On the other hand, the government now, almost like impunity, Nobody talk about no, but nobody. Not many people now are talking. Not nobody. Sorry, not many people now are talking about the government uh, wrongdoing, the crime that the government has committed. You've already mentioned that you are often frustrated when you're so far away from events in Thailand, in distant Wisconsin. I assume that on many occasions you miss Thailand a, a great deal. Can you give us a sense from your perspective of how you see analysing Thailand from such a great distance? Uh, people in Thailand often say that, uh, then I don't know enough. I, I, well, I, don't, I, I never argue because I don't think it's worth to argue I know enough or not enough. I do think, I believe that I know and I understand as much and as little, as good and as bad as people in Thailand with different backgrounds, with different analytical skills, and uh, in different positions. The more frustration is, for maybe to me, because I can't deny that to some extent um, my past still haunts me I and mean, in being activist. Sometimes when just watching and can't do anything, it just, yeah, that's frustrating. Like the, I, I just mentioned a moment ago, just watch, 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 okay, they're talking, they're talking, oh, the, the, the gunshot, and then they, they decide to, to, to give themselves into the police, and then suddenly the voice from Lacha Person just gone, silent. I still can see the picture of empty stage for many more minutes on that day. It's, it's really weird, it, it's, it's really strange, and that kind of frustration, but on the other hand, what, what distance helped me? Uh, yes, I, I never claim that distance helped me understand things better than people inside Thailand either. No, no, I don't claim that because it's not true. Distance gives us different perspective, gives a different sense of urgency, which sometimes is good, sometimes is not good. Uh, distance is, is 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 very I think is very important for for a situation like the polarization in in Thailand in the past month past some months or years because distance helps me help help people like you like me help us who are far away uh, avoid being dragged into or be consumed too much by by the intense polarization we take side yes we take side but. I believe that people like us who are far away, when we take side, it's not the same thing as people in Thailand taking side. They are much more consumed and dragged into the polarization than, 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 than we are. It is hard for people in Thailand to have a distance and they, they really need a distance. I think this is, this is a virtue of having distance for people like us. I was in London in 2006 when you gave a particularly interesting talk about those you consider the kingmakers of Thai history. At other times I'm aware that you've even referred to something of a premocracy in Thailand in honour of the current Privy Council Chairman. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about how you see these kingmakers fitting into Thailand's current politics as it's playing out right now. I know that the jurisdiction of the Less Majesty Law doesn't cover 
Madison or Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let me talk about history. Let me talk about history. Put it this way. <laughs> uh, at almost every transition from one way to another during the Chakri dynasty, almost everyone, there was some explicit turmoil in the court. Even when the transition was smooth uh, between King Rama V to the VI, King Jurangon to King Vajrayudh, the turmoil was not obvious, was not explicit at the moment of transition. But it, it, it was a delay of disguised turmoil. Very troubling situation, but it didn't happen right away, unlike some other transition that it, it took place right away in, in the court. Uh, between Rama the fifth to the sixth, it, it didn't happen that way. But let's say if we count that kind of delay and disguise turmoil. It means that in every case, almost in every case, I can't remember from number, uh, Rama the first to second yet. I think it did. In that case, I think the turmoil took place before. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The turmoil took place before the real transition. So in every case, without exception, there were players who tried to exert an influence, who tried to, and who did participate in the decision about the future of the monarchy. So that kind of transition and those people who involved in the process, uh, many of them, factions, camps in the palace circle, these are people who I call the kingmakers in the past. Should I assume that the present is different from the past? Should I assume that in the present there was no kingmakers, there was no faction, there were no camps, there were no people involved in transition? Ask yourself, and then if you find the answer, then those are the people who I call the kingmakers. Uh, we might want to think, we might wish to think that under democracy, uh, the monarch is above politics. But I believe that the, 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 I mean, you audience or you readers of the Mandela knows, knows they are not naive anymore. That uh, uh, they know that that's the, the, the notion that the monarch is about politics is depends on how you interpret and how you understand it. Anyway, we, if the monarch is about politics, the transition shouldn't be much a problem because it doesn't involve power. But, but as, we, as we know, we're not naive anymore. Uh, so that's why it's a high stake about the transition. And with that high stake, that's why whatever the key makers did, do, or are going to do, it, it, it's very important. Do I know who are they and what they do? Well, whether or not I know, <laughs> it shouldn't be the issue that we can talk. Even even the jurisdiction of less majesty law doesn't cover Canberra, but I think uh, the police can listen to our talk too. So let's not talking about it. I know that this is a particularly tough question to try and answer, but if you were asked to try and sum up the achievements and the failures of Thailand's current king, how would you start? Okay, Nick. How dare you talk about the failures of the current king? <laughs> Next question then. <laughs> you, you definitely don't know enough about Thailand. No, no. <laughs> okay. uh, I will start with kind of three conditional questions. Uh, I mean, I don't, need, I don't expect answer, but let's say this, this whatever uh, people would say about how would they sum up the achievement or failure of the current king. I think there are at least three questions or three factors involved before they can say that. One is that, do you want a geography or do you want critical history? Two is that, uh, achievement and failures in, in what term, to whom, for whom or to whom? And then the third one that came to me right away is that uh, uh, has the less fantasy law been abolished yet? <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I ask this because, for example, the last one. I don't think a, a good and balanced assessment of the achievement, I'm talking about achievement, I'm not, think, not talking about failure at all. I don't think a balanced, uh, let's say, 
evaluation of the achievement of the king is possible under the Les Majesty law. In fact, I mean, we can say that, oh, the law will prevent people from speaking the whole truth. Yeah, yeah, that, that one we know. But I would say what is also interesting is that the law eventually will hurt the current reign. We have the assessment of the current king because any highly positive assessment of the current king will be tacked on with a question mark. People will always make a footnote. Is it true? This is all convincing. This is all trustworthy information. His legacy will be in doubt as long as the law exists. Anyway, uh, if, I, if, I, if I need to assess or sum up the achievement of failure, uh, I'm not sure I can think fast enough. I, I would say uh, uh, it will be the assessment, whatever assessment will be highly debatable for a long time to come. Beyond the current crisis, many Thai and foreign observers are currently trying to work out what might happen at the end of the current king's reign, the ninth reign of this Chakri dynasty. Can you perhaps give us some words of guidance on how you think this could pan out? And, and to say this, I think I, 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 I would be in trouble too for less majesty law, but let's say this is an academic question. So I, have, I hope that people respect the, uh, my freedom to, to raise this issue, which is, do you think had the king passed away, say, before 2006, before the coup, how would we view his current, how would we view the, 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 the king whom we born reign? How would we view or talk about the legacies of the of the reign? I believe that it would have been different from from what is going to happen. What going to be to actually happen? I mean, what actually happened is that now the king hasn't died yet, and he will after after 2006, after 2010. Actually, I believe that now when people people talk about the present reign, the present king. It would be so different from, let's say, the 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 if scenario that had he passed away before 2006. Let me put it in, in another way for for the same issue for the same observation. I believe that the reception and reaction to Paul Halley's book would be so different had the king passed away before the book was published. And what is going to actually happen in the near future? I believe that 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 that's one thing. I, I don't have a, a, a kind of clear idea how to. I mean, the, what you call the guidance, how we do it. But let's say just these observations. These observations just raise questions about the current reign as much as about ourselves, the observers and scholars of Thailand. Finally, Tong Chai, you've been a politically active scholar of Thailand for decades now. I'm wondering, what are your hopes for the future of the country? And in particular, do you have grounds for being optimistic at the moment? In my opinion, it is sad that I believe that Thailand is heading towards a civilian authority, authoritarianism for some time. I mean, a civilian authoritarianism is needed now to to maintain the status quo, which is the democracy with the with the monarchy, the monarchies on the upper floor, on the upper level of politics. Uh, civilian authoritarianism, the kind of examples that I can think about now. I mean, to help. The audience to help our audience to to understand the term. Think about Marcos. Think about Marcos. He came to power by elections, so popular, becoming a cult of Marcos. And the Indian hero, he's a civilian with strong backing from the army by the army. And he ruled uh, with the emergency decree. He ruled with the uh, with the martial law. He manipulated the uh, election, he even tried, he not tried, he even changed constitution to extend his power. Uh, Thailand won't be like everything like Marcos, but I mean, just to give you an idea that 
Uh, I'm not sure that post. <laughs> it must be pessimism, right? But anyway, that's how I think that Thailand is heading towards that way. The question is uh, whether or not this kind of regime would be able to sustain the status quo that the royalists want. I don't think so. Then the question is, uh, would it help? Would it escalate troubles towards, I mean, that kind of civilian authoritarianism, Marcos-like regime, or, or let, not Marcos-like, sorry, maybe too far, because Thailand and Philippines are not uh, very, very similar. There are a lot of differences. Uh, the question is that, would, it, would that kind of regime uh, that, that I, I don't have a clear idea yet, but I think it's, it's going to be along that line. Would that kind of regime escalate or cause more trouble to both democracy and the monarchy? I think so. For democracy, of course, authoritarianism caused trouble for democratization. But what the royalists think that this kind of regime, obedient to the to the monarchies, would be necessary. I mean, it's necessary for to, to maintain the status quo. I think it will hurt them, not in the long future, in the near future. Uh, this sounds pessimistic. On the other hand, I think I, I just take this as change. Change is both good and bad. Serious change are coming. Serious changes have have already taken place. Changing in the rural society that Andrew talked about in, in, in the episode number one and many other things. Nobody can stop these changes. The royalists try to create this kind of civilian authoritarian regime to, to maintain the status quo. No, they can't. It will change. The question is that how much the cost would be, how much damages would be. I, I don't have a clear idea yet. Professor Tong Chai Wenichigun, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to have you via this Skype connection from Madison, Wisconsin. We really appreciate all of your time. Today we've been talking to Tong Chai Winichigun about Thai history and all it entails. I know that Andrew Walker's also been thinking about history recently and in fact as I understand it you've been having a close look at the history of Thailand's national budgets. That's um, right. Can you tell us Andrew um, a bit about what you've found? Yes Nick, I've been looking at the history of the Thai government budget and in particular spending on agriculture and I've come up with a couple of pretty interesting graphs. In this first graph you can see the growth in agricultural spending since the 1960s up until a couple of years ago. And you can see that there's been very substantial increase in government spending on agriculture. I've adjusted these figures for inflation so this graph reflects a real increase in spending on agriculture and you can see that's very substantial indeed. You can also see a similar pattern of increase from this second graph which expresses government spending on agriculture as a percentage of the agricultural GDP. So a very similar pattern of, of long-term growth is evident. So there's, there's a big picture issue here and that is relates to a point I've made a couple of times in, in previous editions of Thailand in Crisis, that the government has become a very significant player in the rural economy. And this is reflected in these budget figures. And that's a very obvious reason why rural people care about the political process. Their desire for political inclusion has a very obvious economic basis and that is they want to have a say in how government funding, which is very significant for the rural economy, is spent. So that's the big picture from these graphs. But there's a very interesting smaller picture if we look at the history of the last 10 years. And let's go back to that first graph, but here I've added another little bit of information. I've highlighted one particular era within that graph, and that is, of course, the era of the Thaksin government. And here you can see a very interesting trend that hasn't been commented on a lot. You can see that, in fact, under Thaksin, agricultural spending within the budget was pretty flat. 
There was a little bit of an increase in the middle of his term, but overall, over his term, that agricultural spending was flat. Now, if we look at the second graph, which expresses government agricultural spending as a percentage of agricultural GDP, we get a very interesting picture indeed. And we can see under tux in, in fact, as a percentage of agricultural GDP, agricultural funding for government funding, sorry, for agriculture declined very significantly. Now, there's a couple of important points here. First of all, these figures challenge the common perception that Tuxin's electoral popularity was based on him flooding the rural economy with money. Now, of course, there's lots of different ways you can support the rural economy apart from spending on agriculture, and Tuxin did spend money in other areas, but these figures show that the the mythology, in a sense, about Tuxin's populism and the amount of money he spent in rural areas needs to be subjected to a bit more scrutiny and that narrative needs to be given a lot more nuance. The other important point, I think, is that these budget figures point to uh, an issue of political vulnerability for the Tuxin government at that time. And that was, I think, that the government was vulnerable in relation to its agricultural policies. And these, these spending figures provide one indication of that vulnerability. And this is something I picked up a lot when I've been working in northern Thailand. I found that people often commented very favourably about Thaksin's social, economic development and health policies, but there was often considerable criticism of the government's lack of support specifically for agricultural activities. And this criticism linked up to a couple of other issues. First, there was concern about the possible impacts of free trade agreements on agricultural producers, especially the impact of the, the free trade agreement with China. And there was also a perception amongst the farmers I was working with that under the Thaksin government, the government was increasingly pushing farmers into the arms of the private sector, in particular through contract farming arrangements. And there was some sense, some discomfort about the idea that the, the government itself was pulling back from agricultural support and agricultural extension and was relying more and more on the private sector to perform that function. So I think one of the one of the issues that's led up to the current political crisis we're experiencing in Thailand at the moment is that the opposition party at the time, the Democrats, weren't really able to develop a credible policy alternative to Thaksin's agricultural policies. Um, Thaksin was vulnerable in this area and the Democrat party wasn't able to capitalise on that vulnerability. As we know, they they practically ran to lose in the 2005 election and they weren't willing to contest the 2006 election at all. And I think this, this inability of the opposition forces at the time to develop some alternative policies that could counter Thaksin's influence is an important factor to consider if we're looking at the origins of the current political crisis. Thanks very much Andrew, that was fascinating as always. It occurs to me looking at some of those graph lines that you've put together that some really interesting things happened from the late 1980s onwards. Um, can you maybe just tell us a bit more about what you think went on there? Well, well, a couple of things. That big spurt in growth on agricultural spending took place during Thailand's economic boom. So there was investment in agriculture during that boom. The other point is that a lot of that growth took place under Democrat Party governments and governments of other political complexions. So I think in looking at this longer term history, we can start to put some of the preoccupation with Thaksin's populism um, in perspective. The things Thaksin did were parts of very long-term trends in Thai's political history. Mm, wow, it's really fascinating. Thanks very much for coming in and I'm sure that a lot of the people out there listening and viewing this podcast and podcast uh, will have enjoyed your, your graphs as much as I did. Pleasure, Nick. Thanks again Thank for you. coming in. 
That's all we're going to have time for today. It's been wonderful that you've joined this fourth episode of Thailand in Crisis. We're really looking forward to episode number five, which will come out at about the same time next week. Uh, in the meantime, of course, you can leave your comments for us at the ANU's YouTube channel, or you can join in the conversation at New Mandala. Until next week, best wishes to all. Thank you.